Well, good morning, everyone. It is uh, 8.28 in the morning. So I'm starting maybe about two minutes early. Uh, and I'm going to set up a, on this, I've got two iPhones, yes. One, one belongs to the Archdiocese, it's not mine. They tried to get all of us priests, all of us priests to, um, what would I say? buy into their own archdiocesan network, which was fine, but I sure as heck wasn't going to give up my own independent um, uh, network of, of, the archdi of my own uh, social media and uh, uh, electronic contact with the web and uh, my own phone number. So this one I never use as an iPhone, but I do use it, for example, for a, a backup. Uh, this is the one that I usually use to record the masses, for example. It belongs to the Archdiocese. It does not belong to me. It's very clear about that. Um, and, um, you know, it, one, one could uh, say, well, that's another uh, example of institutional overreach. Um, if one is of a particular persuasion, one could say liberal institutional overreach. Or if conservative institutional overreach too you know that uh, that that particular pendulum as with so many does swing both ways both ways so yeah John I thank you welcome John we got eight people on already uh, uh, damn I am well connected there's an iPad here with a prayer that I'm going to say in a moment. There is a uh, uh, MacBook Pro here with a stilled picture. Oh, I just have to show this. Of Jonathan Haidt. Um, let me see if you can see it. There he is. Uh, I'm going to be recommending him in a moment, too. Uh, I, I have already, but uh, I think he has a lot to say. So we'll see. Uh, Susan is practicing her Turkish, I see. Good morning. Good morning, Linda. Good morning to all of you. There's 11 people joining at 8.30. It's now 8.31. And I'm going to, what I was going to say, see how I interrupt myself mid-sentence and then I interrupt the interruption and then I interrupt the interruption. Anyway, right now I am going to set uh, this clock for an alarm, alarm at, um, add, okay, uh, at, at eight, 8.40. Okay, remember I said I was going to go 20 minutes. Right after this, I am going to um, going to start, uh, I'm going to go down to get ready for the 9.30 Mass, which um, uh, let me see. What uh, Okay, uh, let me see if the aria from the Goldberg var variations might be a good alarm. Um, sometimes that works, sometimes it'll just default to a blah, 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 kind of alarm. But anyway, um, so I'm going to save it at 8.40. We should, I hope, hear something, um, something telling me it's time to shut up. So, God bless you all. Welcome to all of you. And uh, uh, here is my American Solidarity Cup. I'm not going to say too much about them this morning. I may, you know, over in subsequent days, but I don't think I'm going to say too much about them right now. I do recommend, though, that you look them up. Uh, if you are as disgusted with all the uh, supply, whatever expletive you want, that is going on, especially in social media, and people uh, not willing to uh, consider 
thoughts or ideas, but simply willing to throw names at each other and insult one another. Um, 840. It's only 10 minutes. You're right, Chrissy. Okay, so I've got to go back here and edit. Edit this one. Okay, since we wasted a bit more time on that, I'm going to go to 853. So, <laughs> oh my, I never in my life thought I'd be doing this kind of stuff. Um, then again, it's interesting what, uh, what COVID can accomplish. In fact, it's very interesting what COVID can accomplish. Let's, uh, let's keep praying, not for the end of this, that's God's business, but let's keep praying that we may be changed in accord with whatever God's designs and intentions are. And that we may, maybe in the quiet of COVID confinement, perhaps turning off social media, after 8.53 of course, uh, and allowing ourselves a little bit of quiet, maybe we should pray for the gift of discernment. Uh, that having been said, we have prayers that have been coming uh, from the Archdiocese about the uh, praying for the end of uh, COVID, the end of the pandemic. This past weekend, uh, Archbishop Gomez, uh, along with, and I think it takes courage because stones are thrown at him, from certain sides especially, uh, anybody who speaks out concerning racism is going to get stones, maybe even bullets, thrown at them, or a knee. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, he did speak out about against racism uh, very, very pointedly. In fact, he asked that Tomorrow there be a special mass, and I may say a little more about this at the end, a special mass in every parish, those that are open, or those that are still, well, ev most everybody is, is broadcasting online. Um, the the um, uh, uh, special mass for George Floyd and... Um, the end of racism in our country and I think in our world. And he sent out today, or yesterday, late yesterday, a prayer, text of a prayer to overcome racism. So for our beginning prayer, after we have been going now for about six minutes, uh, I'd like to... Um, just invite you to join in with me in spirit in this prayer to overcome racism. Mary, the friend and mother to all, through your Son, God has found a way to unite himself to every human being, called to be one people, sisters and brothers to each other. We ask for your help in calling on your Son, seeking forgiveness for the times we have failed to love and respect one another. We ask for your help in obtaining from your Son the grace we need to overcome the evil of racism and to build a just society. We ask for your help in following your Son so that prejudice and animosity will no longer infect our minds and our hearts, but will be replaced with a love that respects the dignity of each person. Mother of the Church, the Spirit of your Son, Jesus, warms and enlivens our hearts. 
pray for us. Amen. Now, there's a nice prayer. It suffers from some of the difficulties that so many prayer texts have of being overly abstract. You know, I, I honestly don't think that it is helpful to simply talk about racism as a sin, in part because when you use those abstract words, we tend to look at everybody else rather than ourselves. And racism, sort of like the word love, does mean different things to different people. And you read the, uh, the literature on racism and Ways of defining it are all over the map. So, it's a useful term perhaps to begin an honest and sincere discussion as to just exactly what are the manifestations of racism in my life, or that we might call racism. And I think it does have to do with how we look at one another. If we look at one another as sharing a common humanity with our differences, with good and bad actions, with good and bad motives, good motives being the motives that are essentially altruistic, motives that are essentially concerned about my relationship in a positive way to others. If those are our motives, uh, then we need to say, how can we enhance them? How can I act better on them? How can I be more true, more faithful to my motives? But if our motives are essentially self-centered, what happens? Think about it. If number one is first, all of our actions are going to be directed to all of our attitudes and actions are going to be directed towards putting number one, me, first. That means that when I look at somebody else, there are two um, determining characteristics, shall we say. There are two ways of, of seeing that person. And that may be independent of whatever that person does, because we may not even know what that person is doing. We may surmise, we may guess that because, no, I'm not going to get into that example. We may guess for whatever reasons that that person is somebody who can satisfy my need for ego gratification satisfy my need for getting what I want. In other words, somebody that I can use as a tool for myself. Or we can look at somebody, again, based on a number of things, including perhaps appearance, including perhaps where they are coming from, including perhaps where they are living now in relation to me. Uh, that we would say because of something maybe incidental, maybe something that's appearance, maybe that comes from not knowing them, or maybe because it comes from not knowing the depth of them, the whole of them, but just knowing certain elements that I want to 
um, regard as not being useful for me and maybe being a threat to me, a threat, then that person is labeled an enemy. So, if we are centered in on ourselves, there are two types of people. Those who can further my own interests, whatever they are, and my own interests might be to get pleasure out of them. That interest might be to allow me to get power over them. They do my will. Or, and we call those friends. They call those friends. Or, that person is a threat to me. That person does not advance my interests. That person is trying to move me in a direction I don't want to go. That person looks dangerous. That person is not part of my circle, my family, my tribe, my political persuasion, my religion, my country. That person is a threat. And therefore, I label them as enemies. Now, when Jesus says, love your enemies, basically, he is not telling you something to do. Think about that. He's not telling you something to do when he says, love your enemies. Jesus is telling you and me, look at them in a new way. See the people that you want to classify as enemies in a new light. In fact, see them as fellow children of your Heavenly Father. They are children of the same Father. The same Father makes his son rise, S-U-N, makes his sun rise on the bad and the good, or gives them nourishment, feeds and clothes, gives opportunities, makes the rain pour on both the bad and the good. So, you know, we, 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 we we need to look at things in new ways, not based on what we do in relation to another, but how we relate to that other person in the light of what we do share in common. And everybody can agree, they don't always agree, but everybody can agree that we are all human beings occupying the same fragile planet. Boundaries are artificial determinations. Sometimes, sometimes determined by rivers, and it's interesting in the boundary to Mexico and the and between Mexico and Texas, the Rio Grande, uh, due to certain um, weather conditions, the river can change course. And what happens to the boundary? Or it's artificial. You know, um, I remember reading that the odd shape of the border uh, between Arizona and Mexico was formed because the original intent was to survey that border as a straight line 
actually to the mouth of the um, the Colorado River. And th about halfway through, the surveying party, and I think that had to do with a Gadsden purchase or something. I'd have to look that up. I'm going on a long, long, long forgotten memory here, but it, it, it's kind of interesting. At that point where the southern border of Arizona um, goes veers a little bit northward, it was because the, the surveying party got tired and decided to go up to um, whatever the town was uh, and to finish their work. And I'd have to look on the map to see what that was. But anyway, they just got tired, so they, they just moved the border. They were sort of like, who cares? Well, of course, Mexico and the United States have been fighting over water rights ever since then, and so on and so forth. So borders are very, very arbitrary things. And uh, uh, can we recognize that the things that divide us may be very real, and they need to be overcome, and they need to be worked on, but they are not going to be worked on by simply writing them off and demonizing as social media seems to encourage demonizing the other. Those who disagree with, well, they're not human. They're, uh, call them whatever name we want to. Uh, but we need to recognize common, common ground that there are common values that we share as human beings and as children of the One Father. Again, that's why the American Solidarity Party is something that uh, appeals to me so much. What do they say? Life, community, environment, peace. The uh, other slogan is, uh, I forget now exactly how it goes, um, common ground, common good, and common, I would have to look, look it up again, but our commonality with one another. Uh, in the two minutes that are left before the, the alarm rings, uh, one of the things I'd like to uh, call your attention to is between, if, if you're looking at my page, on Facebook, between the uh, sunrise and this, I posted an absolutely, absolutely delightful video that I had not seen. I think it's been up for only a couple of days, but um, uh, celebrating, shall we say, the the reopening of massage parlors, and maybe recognizing that. Um, the possibility of massaging doesn't necessarily uh, uh, have to do with uh, whether or not a particular establishment is open. Second thing that I'd like to refer to is Jonathan Haidt. Uh, I'm seeing him as perhaps one of the most influential, hopefully influential, voices of purely solid human reason addressing the situation in the world today. He has addressed that situation for, uh, for a good number of years in his research and his writings. I first became acquainted with him because, uh, quite frankly, I have been, uh, I have been, uh, concerned about polarization ever since this uh, conservative-liberal split. There it is. Um, interestingly, that's not the aria from Bach's Goldberg Variations. Too bad. But it says this accessory may not be supported. 
and that's very interesting because because Apple, I mean it's an Apple accessory and they upgrade their operating system and then they tell you that their own accessories are not supported. Please Apple, you've got enough money. You've got enough of my money. You've got enough of other people's money. Yeah, you can do a better job than that in your great big spaceship design circular um, uh, design laboratory up in Cupertino where you make plans to send to China uh, to pay China money to dominate the world. Ah, <laughs> uh, well. Uh, anyway. Uh, Moral Foundations. The, the book that I ran across was Jonathan Haidt's The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. That came out, I think, about 10 years ago or more. And uh, it was resonating with me very much because uh, I was seeing, you know, the real problem is not those damn liberals or those damn conservatives or anybody else, the real problem is what's happening in between us. I can remember one series in the LA Times some years back, I think it was in the early 2000s, I've been searching for it online, but it was a series, a whole section of the LA Times that asked uh, people to address in writing certain social problems uh, from a liberal point of view and from a conservative point of view. And why I'd keep buying their products? Because they're good. That's why. Uh, and they are. Uh, and what I found was they were all talking alongside one another. They were not addressing each other's concerns. They were simply stating, talking without listening. And so their, their way of addressing concerns never met. What does that mean? Well, when I address the concern this way, anybody else who sees it differently, they're wrong, they're evil, and so on. We've got to get over that. I found this subtitle to be to draw me in why good people are divided by politics and religion. You know, somebody once asked me what's the hardest part of being a priest or a pastor? And my answer invariably, and yeah, I've got to stop right here, but my answer invariably is the hardest part of being a priest or a pastor working with a flock of sheep, working with a community, working with people who profess to be disciples of Christ. The hardest part of being a pastor is to stop good people from killing one another. Because that is what happens so much in parishes. The conflict of parishes sometimes is kind of deadly because people do, who are good, seem to be almost intent on killing one another. Maybe not physically, but certainly morally, intellectually, um, fantasizing perhaps how we can cut them down, which means, of course, how we can uh, convert them to my way of thinking, or silence them. And isn't silencing somebody, that doesn't convince them. Calling people names doesn't convince them, doesn't change their hearts. How can we actually address other people in a way that may really have opened up the possibility of their hearts being changed? That, I think, is what Jesus meant by 
loving your enemies. So I'll be talking more about this righteous mind. If you want, I would suggest, if you have some time, and if you have the power of thinking beyond two-sentence sound bites or tweets, if you have the power to think beyond the Twitter limit or the sound bite limit, that news of both left and right, you know, they don't they don't give in-depth analysis. They comment on sound bites so very often. So look up Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T. Look him up on YouTube. There's a couple of, uh, there's, there's a number of presentations that he's given, even fairly recently, that if you've got an hour to spare, ah, it might be really, really good to spend it with Jonathan Haidt and see what he has to say. You may not agree with everything, but I think he does have a worthwhile perspective in helping us to navigate our world today. So, as suspected, it is one minute to nine um, over time. Um, was anybody taking bets on whether or not I would actually keep to my deadline, keep to my limit? Anyway, <laughs> that's, that's very intriguing. Okay, this is a time when I usually used to start. There was the nine o'clock time signal. So, let's pray. Our Father. Father of us all. Father of us, our Father. Father of us all, who has created all to make one us. Just as the Trinity is the model, you have given yourself as the model of how we are to relate to one another because you are not simply an almighty power out there telling us what to do, even giving us from a distance life. You have invited us through your Son Jesus. You have invited us into your own life. And the Trinity which we celebrated yesterday, Father, is the image of your own life shared with us. Or not shared as given to us, but shared as in bringing us into it. So, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. May your name be holy. May your name be acknowledged. May your name be loved. May your name be brought into our hearts on earth as it is in heaven. May we begin feebly with your grace. May we begin feebly to replicate and I use that term very advisedly to replicate here on earth just like a virus, just like that strand of RNA, which you know, you designed. Replicate the, your, uh, your life here on earth. That's what, that's what you're telling us, isn't it? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us what we need to be your people. Give us the bread of your word. 
give us the bread that you give to us in order to be sure that all are fed, not just our bellies filled, to be sure that all are fed, all are nourished, all can share at the same table. Give us the vision to make that happen, even if there is so much resistance. Even if the people that we class as enemies want to kill us. Give us the vision and the grace to act in accord with that vision in a way that overcomes those antagonisms, those conflicts, those attitudes that doesn't simply win or destroy, dominate. That's a word that's been up, isn't it? Dominate uh, those who differ from us. Advenyat regnum tuum. May your kingdom come. Now, so give us this day our daily bread. And what is the doorway? to our daily bread. Forgive us. But forgiveness cannot happen unless it begins with us. Our forgiveness of one another is the is the doorway that leads from your forgiveness of us. We experience forgiveness we imitate that forgiveness, and it leads to your forgiveness. Susan, your bet was 30 minutes, and you underestimated that. Well, we'll see what happens tomorrow. Forgive us, Lord, as we forgive. Do not let us fall into temptation, because temptation is all around us. But deliver us from the evil one from all that is evil, from all that would harm our inner spirits. And hail Mary, pray for us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit because you have shared your life with us and you are doing so eternally without end. Help us as we prepare ourselves now. In whatever time you have left for us, we prepare ourselves to step into the wonderful world of your eternity together with all of our brothers and sisters whom you challenge us now to love and will mm, expect us to be ready to love for an eternity, for eternity with you. Amen. God bless you all in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, about a half hour or a little less, I'll be down in the chapel uh, beginning the Mass. Bye-bye now.